Well, I don't know about Mod. Well, Hackney, yeah, we'll see. Um, so when I was growing up, there were basically two categories of things. There were necessities and luxuries. And necessities were things that were adequate. And adequate was good enough. And better than good enough was a luxury, which mean, which generally meant we didn't get it. Um, I grew up on a small dairy farm in southern Ontario. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. It's not a great business to be in if what you want is leisure and riches. And we, um, you know, we did own the farm, which was great. My dad bought it from my grandfather for a dollar. And it doesn't sound very impressive, but it was a dollar of his own money. So, you know, there was virtue in that. And, but otherwise, you know, we had what we needed. You know, we had all we, all we needed to eat, all the milk we could drink, and we drank a lot of milk. And we, uh, you know, we, but we didn't have a lot of nice things. We didn't have a lot of new things. We didn't have things that we wanted or coveted, you know, if we... My uh, first four or five pairs of skates were all third, fourth hand, same for my bikes and that sort of thing. Um, if Basically, if something cost a considerable amount of money, we just got used to the idea of not having it. So uh, new cars, no, never had those things. Swimming pool, no. Uh, vacations, you know, heard about vacations. You know, we'd see them on the Brady Bunch. They'd go to the Grand Canyon or Hawaii or something. But generally, it wasn't something that you'd do because it costs money. Um, with one exception, when I was nine years old, uh, my family, my parents, my two younger sisters and me, and a middle-aged couple uh, who were friends of my parents named Ivan and Muriel, which come to think of it, man, is there a better name for a middle-aged couple in the 70s than Ivan and Muriel? <laughs> Um, Stan and Edie, maybe? Um, but uh, anyway, we all piled into a Buick Wildcat. And the two men were in the front seat with one kid, and the two women were in the back seat with two other kids. And, um, you know, nowadays you wouldn't even get out the driveway without Child Protective Services stopping you. But we went from southern Ontario to Vancouver Island and back over three and a half weeks. And it was the best three and a half weeks of my childhood. But one of the things that really stri sticks out for me, you know, as much as going to Banff or Yellowstone or Vancouver or Calgary or any of those other places, was the trip was largely financed by this enormous jar of change that my mom had been saving for years. <laughs> it was this incredible ritual. You know, you'd, you'd pull up into a, a, a diner in, in North Dakota my mom would go to the trunk and haul this thing out. There was just, I, I don't know, I've seen fish tanks that were smaller than this jar. And, um, you know, and then there would be the you know, end of the crappy meal in some one-horse town in Minnesota or Wisconsin or something like that. And my mom would start picking out exact change, mind you, which was easy to do with this five gallons of change that we were lugging around from uh, right across the continent. Um, but that was typical of my parents, and my mom in particular. They, they were born during the Depression, and that really informed their view of money and what it was worth, and to really hang on to it, not in a kind of grasping, stingy way, but just because you just didn't know if you were going to get more. So you better hang on to what you had. And so my mom became this genius, this absolute savant at stretching money. Uh, and one of the things that... Uh, I remember most vividly from my childhood in that respect is um, hair washing day. We, we, we had a 15-minute window per week of hair washing uh, for my sisters and me. And what my mom would do would be on Saturday afternoon, she'd call my little sister into the laundry room and uh, dose her head under the tap, and then she'd really meticulously pour out this single capful of baby shampoo. And then, you know, she'd lather it up on her head. And then she'd call in my other sister, into the laundry room, put her head under the sink and got it wet. And then she'd take the lather from my little sister's head, <laughs> scoop it up, put it on Jody's head, and then send her away to scrub herself while she rinsed out Sheila's he uh, head. And then she'd call me in. And then she'd put my head under the sink and then she'd take Jody's lather and scoop it all up and then plunk it down on my head and tell me to go uh, walk away for, you know, a lot of you are laughing and cut. Were you rich kids who got your own cap full of shampoo? <laughs> yeah, thought so, thought so. 
Um, my mom could make a 99 cent bottle of shampoo last a family of five for a year. And, you know, she deserved a medal for that. Um, and we never got lice. It, it's, it's remarkable. I, I don't know if their standards were too high for us, but never got lice. <laughs> um, I, I mentioned it, uh, at the beginning about necessities and luxuries, and I forgot there, there's a, there was actually a third category, and that was stuff that was free or cheap. And our house was full of stuff that was free or cheap. And cheap wasn't really a pejorative term in our household like it is for a lot of people. Cheap was basically a synonym for awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, mom, I want this. No, you can't have, but it's cheap. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, maybe. Um, this was in the 70s, and, and there was this thing in the 70s called encyclopedias. And these were collections of books, about 10 to 20 volumes, arranged alphabetically, and they contained basic knowledge of everything. <laughs> there was a staple of middle-class homes, uh, you know, primary resource for school projects. Or, you know, if it was Saturday night and you just started wondering, what is the chief export of Bolivia anyway? Ah, <laughs> we have an encyclopedia, uh, pre-Google world. Um, and one thing that happened was a uh, really interesting phenomenon in those days was um, sometimes in magazines or newspapers you'd see an ad. An uh, encyclopedia company would send you a, the first copy, the first volume of the encyclopedia for free. Or you go to the supermarket and there'd be a display f for uh, encyclopedias and um, they would give you the A volume for 99 cents. And the idea behind this was once you had the knowledge of A unlocked for you, you would buy the whole set. My mom wasn't going to fall for that one though. So she bought, she got her every A volume she could get her hands on for 99 cents or free. And so we had this shelf at home that was all A volumes of encyclopedias. And so all my school projects were Aztecs, Amazon, Aardvarks, first entry and um, it, it, you know all kinds of stuff like the Appalachians, Alberta, the Athabasca River, all that sort of stuff and it got to the point where I started having this fantasy about being on Jeopardy and asking for things beginning with A <laughs> you know this ancient Chinese what is an abacus <laughs> this South American Mount what are the Andes <laughs> and then my money problems would have been solved but you know, it, and it's this combination of things. I mean, my parents had this weird relationship with money and weird ideas about about what it meant to have money or who were the people who had money. Uh, they could never understand rock stars, right? Like, I mean, my parents were not particularly tuned into pop culture, and in fact, this just came back to me. My, True story, like most of these are mostly true. Um, uh, the day that Elvis died, I was helping my dad with something. And my sister came running out to where we were working and said, Elvis died. And my dad said, Elvis who? <laughs> it, he actually did know people named Elvis. This was rural Ontario. Um, but anyway, they'd see a picture of, of let's say, uh, Bruce Springsteen or something like that. And they'd say, he makes so much money. Why is he dressed like that? He could afford a nice suit. Why wouldn't he play in a nice suit if, instead of wrap, ripped up jeans? If you have a lot of money someday, you won't dress like that, will you? And all I'm thinking is, wow, he has real Levi's. <laughs> someday I'll have real Levi's too when I have money. And you know, my, my parents, they, they, thought, they thought tipping was something rich people did. You know, if they wanted to make a big show of largesse or be extravagant, and uh, oh, here, how you're a fine looking young lass, here, have a tip. Like this kind of stuff. And I'll never forget the first time uh, my first, uh, I took, or I had my first serious girlfriend meet my parents. And we went for lunch and uh, of course, my dad paid for it and didn't leave a tip. <laughs> and so I kind of surreptitiously, surreptitiously went back to the table to leave a tip. My mom asked me, what are you doing? And I said, um, it's just leaving a tip. And uh, she said, really, was it, was it that good? 
And I said, Mom, you kind of have to leave a tip. Well, they get paid, don't they? And I said, yeah, they get paid four bucks an hour. And, and this look of astonishment and revelation crossed my mom's face. And she said, Me, you can make four bucks an hour doing this? <laughs> and, and, she, and you just see her head, and, and like the real wheels turning in her head, and she's thinking, I've been schlepping food at home like some kind of chump, and I could have been making four bucks an hour. <laughs> and I have to say, that I really internalized a lot of this stuff, like this idea that, you know, you, you just, it was somehow presumptuous or, um, I don't know, unseemly to want nice things or to spend a lot of money on something you really wanted. And, you know, this did come in handy when I got to university because, you know, it meant I didn't really require a big adjustment in my standard of living. <laughs> but what really became useful was when I got to grad school and I was in uh, an English program. And, uh, and this was in the 90s, and of course, um, cultural studies was all the rage, and finding uh, non-hegemonic subject positions was very important. And this became, this became pretty competitive. You know, I was in, you know, there were women, there were people of color, there were women of color, there were transgendered, gays, lesbians, and I was a straight white male. <laughs> you know, it, I was this close to being the man. And there, and there are a lot of places where it's good to be the man, but grad school in the 90s was not one of them. And, and you know, like I, I had lesbians of color in this program. And I just remember feeling that, man, it would be so great to be a lesbian of color. <laughs> They've got it made. And then I realized I could play the class card. And I could start sentences with phrases like, well, as a member of the working class, or, you know, that may be true as a middle class lesbian, but <laughs> as a member of the lower middle class, you know, I'm, I think you should uh, problematize some of your assumptions. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's also funny, like, the way you can internalize these things, and, and and this is where the, the title kind of comes into play here about worth, because it can actually filter down into your conceptions of what you're worth. And, you know, my, um, my partner is somebody, we actually ended up, we had actually worked at the same place before we knew each other. And when we were talking and sharing notes about where we'd s almost crossed paths in the past, it, uh, it came out that, you know, she had a BA in English, I had three quarters of a PhD in English, we worked at the same place. They asked her when we both started working there at the same time. They asked her what she thought she was worth, or I better say, I, they asked me what I thought I was worth, and I'd say, I don't know, uh, forty thousand. They asked her what she was worth, and she said uh, about ninety thousand. And I got paid forty thousand. She got paid ninety thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something I've only really just started to really think about. Is wait, you know. If you're used to not getting the things that you really want, and you can't enjoy the things that you really want, you start enjoying not having them and finding ways uh, of enjoying not having them, such as telling stories about not having much money in front of an audience. And, you know, there, there's no huge reveal here, but, um, you know, it is enough to make you wonder, uh, to reassess what, uh, what a person is worth, and what, and, and to reassess the worth of having things you really want. And I think I'm just gonna go think about that for a little bit longer, thanks.